Welcome back to the Cool Smile Podcast brought to you by Maca Media. Today I am joined by Max Shervington. Shervo, how's it going? Yeah, good mate. Yourself? Yeah, good. So a bit of context, Shervo is an elite runner. He's currently clocking some insane distance every week. And today before this, he's just run 20 kilometers in the hills in the rain, which is <laughs> scary to think of driving here in the rain. It was pretty hectic. Oh, it was pretty fun up there. So right now, how many kilometers a week are you running? Aiming for 132 each week. And then it's like, if your body's a bit sore, you just kind of take it a little easy on some days and you end up running a little bit less. How do you cope with the mental battle for that? For me, running is such a mentally tough sport and to do it every single morning, you almost have to be like David Goggins. Like <laughs> it seems so tough. How do you cope with the mental battle of running? I suppose like you just kind of, I've committed to this now and like, I know there's a long-term goal of just keep running as quick as I can. That's what I like about it. It's like quite a quantitative sport. You can like figure out, oh, I want to run this time. I want to win this race. So you just kind of think long-term and then it's like, you got to do all the training every day to get to that point. Do you ever get mental fatigue from it? Sometimes, like sometimes I'll run by myself, even when I'm with my training squad. Um, like this morning, I kind of ran a bit by myself. You're a bit faster than everyone else. Each. Today I raced a little bit, got a little bit ahead. As but, you do. But no, sometimes you can like just take it easy and just run by yourself, which is good mental break. Um, but then sometimes it's really good to be run with my squad that I'm in. So it's a bit of a balance between running alone and running with others. Yeah. Yeah. I see you the other day. I was, um, I actually probably run about two days a week by myself. And then I've got maybe four days a week where I'm with my squad. And then there's another day where I'm with everyone at the get up and go run club. Shout out Narodify. Yeah, shout out Narodify. A question I wanted to ask because I've started doing a little bit of running in the mornings with one of my mates and we're running along the train line. Yeah. So the cyclist sort of path. Yeah, yeah. And while we're running, every now and then a cyclist will drive mm, fast and past. abuse us, like oh, yeah. yell a bit of abuse at us saying, oh, you're taking up oh, half, you just gotta give it back. half the path. Like yeah. what the fuck? Um, my question is, are runners like that? Do you ever find when you're running, you run past runners and they'll like, spray you like cyclists or runners are a bit nicer guys than cyclists are? Oh, I reckon runners are a bit nicer. I get pretty, the one thing that gets me, I run a lot around Cot, um, down Marine Parade and people actually will try and move out of your way but I've actually thought that it's better if they don't know that I'm coming because you're moving at pace. Like if they try and move away from you or if you yell out or oh, on your left, on your right, then they might get it wrong and they might move actually into you. Has that so, happened before? Yeah, quite a lot. It happens. And like, so I don't say anything now and I'll just find my path, go for it. And like, they won't ever hit me. Yeah. And it's the walk, I've run down Marine, Marine Parade a few times and it's the walkers with dogs that take up the entire path and expect you to run on the grass around yeah. them off the path. No, when they run in like a pack of four, I mean, walk in a pack of four. Well, have you ever sprayed anyone while you've been running or been sprayed? Nah, we kind of just, if I'm with my mates, we'll just be like, oh, that was annoying. But we don't really like spray anyone because it's pretty, pretty rude. A cyclist can get away with it because you've got more, you've got so a helmet on. And yeah, and you're not going to be able to tell who they are. I feel like with a cyclist as well, they can get away with yelling at a runner because the runner's never going to catch up to them after they abuse them. Yeah, true. So like we didn't really get a chance to respond to this cyclist that swore at us. I think it was on Tuesday morning. Yeah. And oh, I was so close to just screaming out at him, but I thought we'll keep the runner's rep nice. Yeah. And let, let the cyclists be the dickheads, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're a cyclist and you're watching this, I'm very sorry. I'm sure there are nice cyclists out there, but there's a lot of not nice cyclists out there. No, that's true. And they've got a bit of reputation for even like when you're driving on the road and they, they take up the entire road. Well, car drivers seem to, I mean, we all like dislike cyclists. So I think we've got to keep the runners like in the good books for all the drivers because you're really not going to come off well if you get hit by a car when you're running. <laughs> I've run up some, up at my farm, we've gone and done some runs down like Great Northern Highway, um, been to more road and they're like 110k roads and I'm running on the left and you don't want to piss off the big truck drivers because they'll, they'll, they'll clean you up. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why there's a lot of cyclist road accidents. It's not because it's an accident, but it's targeted. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Anyways, moving back to the running. So you've obviously been running for a long time now. You're running in school from memory. 
Yeah, started in year 12. So Keechi and Toby Knox Little were the big, uh, big kind of drivers for me in running. So started, yeah, running with them. Uh, Tony Doney was the coach of cross country in year 12. So that was where I sort of really got into it um, and started, got, got to do the Aths in year 12. Um, Riley Waters was one of the top runners in the 800 back then. Um, and so, yeah, there was all those guys and I was just trying to pretty much just get as good as them. Um, and never, never really did. It. Yeah. Well, I never really did get as good as them at school, but it was only after when I went to uni and then, uh, kept running. Why did you decide to keep running? Like, how's it, has it changed your life to a point where you've decided that this is something I really enjoy doing or is it something you don't enjoy doing or? Oh, I feel like I'd have to enjoy it at this point, but, um, yeah, no, I think it's something that I did. I actually did a lot of music back in the day, and some of the viewers might remember. What instrument? Oh, I played the trombone and the tuba. Oh, so, trombone camp. So I was quite in the artsy side of things at school, and which was fine. I didn't mind. I thought it was cool. Um, <laughs> some of other people probably don't, but no judgment here. No, no, no. It's um, We're I enjoyed it. Judgment free here on the podcast. Yeah, judgment free. Good. Um. Yeah, so I enjoyed that and then got to uni, tried doing music at uni, really didn't like it. The people were just not really what the vibe I wanted to be hanging out with. Um, and so I was like, well, what's my alternative? I could do sports. And so then that's when I was living at St. Catherine's College in my first year and there was like sports every week. Um, so there was like soccer, footy, volleyball. Every second week there was a different sport being played. So I did a lot of that. And then it was like, all right, now I really like sport. So that was where the kind of drive to running became. Do you think that there's a smaller burnout rate for the late bloomers in sports like running? I, I think so, yeah. I think people that start when they're really, really young just become almost too dedicated too young. And there's a risk, like some of them do really well. There's cases out there where people will start – like you look at Jakob Ingebrigtsen, who some people might know. Is he of him. the 1500 world record holder? So he's not the world record holder, but he won the Olympic gold medal um, in Tokyo. So I, think I watched his race the other day in preparation for this. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So he's crazy. He's like the kind of guy that he started when he was basically as soon as he could run, he was running. Oh, okay. And he's has got a funny story because his older two brothers started running before him because his dad was an engineer who had no running background, but wanted his kids to be elite runners. So he researched everything he could to be able to figure out how to make his three sons elite oh, runners. Geez. So he tried on the first one and he got really, really good. Uh, it's either Heinrich or Philip Ingebrigtsen. We'll, like, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll name him Philip. One first. of them, one of them's older. And, um, yeah, so the first one was good. The second one was also really good. And then it just turned out the third one was like exceptional. And like, he's got the world record over the two mile, which is, you know, he's got a crazy time for that. Can't remember off the top of my head, but, um, but yeah, he's a case of a person who started really young and was just a prodigy. Um, but then, yeah, to answer your question, like the late bloomers, I think I would fall in that category. I know of a lot of other people who I've seen around the track who, who are, um, who have also started later and you don't get that burnout. I don't think. Well, I feel like if you're going to bloom a bit later, it's because you want to do it. Whereas if you're going to be doing it from a younger age, it could almost be pushed on a by Potentially, family and yeah, coaches, family. et cetera. And it feels yeah. like you're not doing it for yourself, but if you start getting into it when you have a bit more autonomy in your life, then it's going to be more of your decision. And then if the drive is coming from yourself, then the burnout rate will probably not be as bad. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think that happens in all sports and all things in life. Like I remember when I was playing golf at a high level when I was like 10. Well, I was trying one, to hitting high level. Ones. Oh, not back then. But I say high level, I take that back. When I was trying to play at a high level when I was very young, I could see so many young kids who all just had their dads pushing them to be elite prodigies. And now I look back and... It was actually the kids who started later in their sporting career that are the ones that actually wanted to do well themselves rather than their parents wanting them to do well. So how do you come across the 1500 metre and choose that to be your specialty for running? Because I feel like that's a very 
painful distance to run mentally. Oh yeah. The first, the first time I did it, I thought the same. Um, I actually started like with 400s and 800s. Um, that was my first year of track in 2021. And yeah, never touched a 15. Uh, I did one in 2022 and hated it. I went out really hard and because it's like three and three quarter laps, it's a lot further than what I anticipated. Um, and I blew up hard. So sub four minutes. At least. No, no, that was like four, four or six was my first one. And the world records 327. Yeah. 327. So yeah, I had a big blow up. Um, but then as I trained more and added more Ks to my week, it actually became easier because it's more of an aerobic race rather than the 800, which is like slightly more anaerobic, which is more sprint. So yeah, it became an easier race as I got fitter and fitter. And now that's my main race. And I supplement with longer distance races, such as the three and the 5k to kind of top up my, my engine um, like my aerobic engine. And then I'll still do some 800s every now and again, just to top up my speed as I need it. So yeah. is the 1500, you'd still be reaching the lactate, lactate threshold and you'd still yeah. be a bit anaerobic because they all work at the same time. It's just whichever energy source is being prioritized. Um, I hope I didn't butcher that definition. No, no, that's perfect. That's um, exactly right. Like the 800 is almost 50-50. And some people would argue, you know, the, the numbers, but it's about 50% speed, 50% endurance. So what would the 1500 be? It's probably, I think it's like 80, 20, but it could be like 70, 30. Were well, your legs are feeling like jelly at the end of a 1500 though? Yeah, but probably not as much as an 800 because an 800 is just so hard on your body um, speed wise. And last year in Adelaide, your kind of running career and aspirations blew up a bit when you had a really good 1500 race? Yeah, so it was back in, in February. Um, I ran a really, uh, it was a good race. Um, I came 11th, but was able to run a time that I didn't really think I was gonna run. And to be honest, the whole, like from the start of this year in January, I was a 349 runner. And then we had one race in early Jan, which, almost wouldn't have happened because in the race, it was a thunderstorm coming in mid race. And it was only 10 minutes after the race that the whole event got canceled, but I ran a 344. And then that meant that I was actually able to go to Adelaide track classic and run in the B race. I wasn't ever going to get in the A race. Yeah. And so I got really fortunate with the weather so that I was able to even run that time. And then when we went to Melbourne and then to Adelaide early this year, it was only two nights before the Adelaide race when I found out Peter Bowl was pulling out or Peter Bowl or someone else was pulling out. So then I got moved up into the A race and that's when I ran the really quick time. Would you have won the B race? Oh, m one of the other WA guys, Tom Moorcroft, he won the B race and I'd like to think I would have beaten him. But Was your time faster in the... Yeah. Yeah. I ran a 340.9 in the A race, which it was only because I was getting towed. Like I was just, my instruction was sit at the back and just hold on to the pace because the guys at the front, like Cam Myers and Jesse Hunt, um, they were going for like Olympic qualification time. Um, I think they just missed out. They what is the Olympic qualification? 333.5. Yeah. So it's rapid. But um, they were going for that and I just wanted to hang on basically. And by hanging on, I was able to run a great time, 340.9. And then you, you were telling me that then that opened up the door to then go to the nationals that were coming up and you even got injured in the Adelaide race. Yeah. So the in the Adelaide race, I think I like strained my hamstring with like 400 meters to go because it was definitely strained after the race and I felt something with yeah, the 400 mark to go. Um, so it was amazing that I even was able to finish it somehow. But yeah, then had to go through the rehab process like of nationals was in April and this race was in February. So I had like a few months to get fit um, and get that speed back in my legs. 
So really, it, I took a week off running and then pretty much went straight back to 100K week, which might have been a bit silly, but it felt okay. And then I was able to get back on the track. And how'd you go on the nationals at the end of the season last year? Yeah, it was it was good. It was my first 1500 at nationals because prior to that, I had only done 800s in Brisbane the year before and Sydney the year before that. Um, but it was a good race. I unfortunately got probably in the hardest heat because there was three heats and I had Stewie McSwain, um, who is like Australian prodigy in distance running. Um, and he's known for going out quick and hard. And you tried to keep up with him or? Well, I sort of, yeah, I had to. So it was top three next three fastest times that go into the final. And that was the goal to go to nationals and make a final. So I had to come top three or run a very quick time. And the strategy that Stewie did um, was go really hard. So I was stuck in fourth place the entire race. There was guys behind me in fifth backwards who were like way off me. And then there was the three guys at the front who were also way off. So I was sort of stuck in no man's land and couldn't really, it was too fast to be able to get with them. And I didn't want to sit back because you know, yeah. too slow. So I just missed out, which was a shame. Um, the time wasn't quick enough to get me into the final. Was it Adelaide time? Uh, no, I ran a 3.47 in that heat. Um, typically heats are slower times than what you can do in a time trial-like race. Yeah, okay. Why is that? Um, because I think the tactics of heats is different. Like you wouldn't normally, the way we ran that heat was very quick for the first two laps. And you wouldn't normally do that in a 1500. You'd probably want it to be more consistent pace. And then bring it home on the last lap. Yeah. So it was probably not exactly the right type of race for me to run quick. And it was a good test of how long I can hold It's good for. experience though. Yeah. yeah Lessons great. learned. It was my first um, 1500 at the Nationals. So Was yeah. 1500 a popular distance or it's not that popular? It's very popular now. Yeah. You'd it's, think that it wouldn't be because it's so painful. But. Well, I suppose like the 800 is more like there's not a whole lot you can do tactically wise. Like if you make a mistake in the 800, it's pretty much all over. You've got one one decision to make. And in the 1500, that there's more kind of opportunities to make moves. So it lends itself to being a more exciting race for the viewers as well as being more exciting when you're actually in the race yourself. Yeah, okay. That's why I think, and it's probably a lot easier to train for. So people, there'll be more people that can easily train for the 15 because it's got more aerobic um, and you can't really build speed as quickly as you can build up an aerobic. So you'd say the 1500's more like dedication and hard work and discipline in preparing for it, whereas the short distance have a bit more luck involved with natural talent? Potentially, yeah. And I'd definitely say that the shorter differences have hard work involved, but it's more of a different kind of- You've got to of, have the combination of hard work and the talent just biomechanically to be able to- Yeah, I think so. You've got to have like, I am too skinny to be running 800s in my opinion and others' opinion. So my body lends myself better and my engine, like how my body runs is better suited to a 1500. Your slow twitch muscle fibers? Potentially, yeah. I'm a slow twitch muscle fiber man myself. Yeah. I'd like to think i got a bit of speed in me though. I don't have any speed in me. <laughs> um, so when it comes to the actual race day, do you, do you get race day nerves or anything like that? Do you have any routines, any superstitions when it comes to your race day of how you want everything just in a perfect way so you can compete at your best? Yeah, I suppose. I don't really, I don't get superstitious. Like if my routine's different each time, it doesn't really phase me. Um, and the, the biggest thing that I get nervous about is nutrition. So like what foods I'm eating yeah, and especially not so much like the quality, but more like the timing. Um, you don't want to feel full going into a race too full because then you feel like congested and no one wants that. Um, and you don't want to feel empty because then you feel like you've got nothing to give. So it's just finding that balance of like feeling well fueled that is always making me nervous on race day. So that's something I'm really like working on at the moment, but, um, it's all about eating big pastas the night before. Carb loads. Yeah. Te yeah. Sort of. So do you have many carbs before the race or cause 
it, it top up your glucose and all of that. But at the same time, you don't want to feel carb heavy. Like I've noticed if I have like a lean protein before I go on exercise as opposed to a carb, you have more energy from the carb, but you feel a bit more blur as yeah. opposed to feeling a bit cleaner with a nice like can of tuna or something. Yeah. Well, I had a nutritionist for a little while and she was very much um, teaching me carbs before, protein after. So that was kind of the mentality, like have – crappy carbs is what she called it. So like white bread, nothing, you know, healthy. She'd literally give me the opportunity to go and eat the foods that you would never give to anyone if they're on a diet. Like, like lollies, a like white bread with like honey on it. I actually would just get a honey jar or like a squeeze and I'd squeeze it into my mouth. Well, it's a good glucose a top up. Yeah. And I thought it was good and it worked in Adelaide. So, so the training for this, doing it for such a prolonged period of time, training every single week at such high Ks that you're clocking. Uh, how do you see the future of that? Do you see, like, do you worry about that? Is it something you're constantly thinking about and like it's plaguing your mind or you're just, you're so pragmatic about it that you take it week by week and it doesn't really affect you? Yeah, I think it's important to think ahead. So like I've got like an Excel tracker for my Ks, which I like to do. Um, which is probably my nerdy self there, but, no, um, I write that, I yeah. write that, <laughs> but yeah, I do that. But then it's important not to go too detailed into that because the reality is that niggles will happen when you're running these high Ks. And if you like force yourself into thinking, oh, I have to hit 130 Ks every week, week on week, you'll actually then run when you shouldn't or run a little bit too far when you should be taking it a bit easy. So I've sort of come to a point now where I'm like, if I don't hit 130, it's okay. Like this week it was 125. Last week it was 132. Like it's kind of, it doesn't really matter as long as I'm getting all the sessions done, I'm still doing the volume. So like thinking about running off time rather than off distance is been a, that's been a big learning curve for me. So rather than going, oh, I'm going to go out and do 14 Ks, uh, I'll go, oh, I'm going to go run and run for an hour. If I'm feeling good, I'll run 14. If I'm feeling slow, I'll run 12.5. And we just talked about diet with performance day, but diet while you're training, is it still super strict dieting or are you a bit more lenient with your diet while you're doing the 130K weeks and really pushing it? I'll eat a lot. <laughs> I pretty much will eat a massive pasta each night. I'm not one for a huge breakfast because I load up so much the night before. So... Yeah, this this morning I just had wheat bix um, after my run. I won't typically eat before runs, um, but I am learning that I need to do a little bit before morning sessions. Just like a muesli bar or something. Yeah, like a piece of toast even. Um, so before sessions, when I've got two times a week, I'll now try and eat a little bit because I just don't have With a bit of strawberry jam on it. Yeah, a little bit of honey sometimes. Oh, a bit of um, orange marmalade jam is quite good. Orange marmalade jam. That's Nana's treat. Yeah, <laughs> Nana's treat. <laughs> when I was a little kid, I used to have all that. So, And the injury prevention side of things, because you're running so often, how much recovery are you doing? Um, by recovery? Like a lot of stretching and mobility work and yep. just even ice baths. Yeah, I don't really touch the ice baths. Um, I've done a bit of like self research just by talking to people and ice baths I feel like might be overhyped really I don't I don't know exactly I'm not an expert but I feel like there's a whole lot of Instagramness about ice baths and sauna it's definitely influencer arised yeah if that could be a word yeah it's definitely instagrammed yeah um and which is not a bad thing I think people should do it looks fun and the challenge of doing an ice bath and a sauna, I've done it in the past. You like jump between and it's great fun. You do it with people, it's even more fun. Um, but I think there's potentially risks involved with athletes and doing ice baths because if you're training every day, you don't want your muscles and everything to get too tight and cold. You want heat. Because you'll get soft tissue injuries? Oh, uh, I'm not too sure about the science, but I know – what my physio tells me is heat is the best because that promotes blood flow and then that will help recovery. So if you're putting yourself in like ice cold water, that's going to slow that down. I used to do it um, 
ways, no plug here for myself, <laughs> but back in the day when I was in school and I was doing a ways for some sport, um, we do the uh, ice bath and then the hot bath in the waste building. Yeah. And what we were told, the mechanism of that is it constricts all the veins in the ice bath and then it opens up all the arteries and veins in the hot bath and it just gets all the lactate out and yeah. it flows all the blood through all the muscles and it just speeds up the recovery process. Yeah, that's I've, I've heard that as well. And, yeah, that's a good thing to like do. If you have both. but Doing both. Yeah, no, I've, I've definitely heard that. Um, that's a lot harder to get like a – both accessible all the time, I guess. Yeah, unless you've got waste or some sort of – the problem is that it's so expensive these days to go to a lot of these places that offer yeah. the recovery. It's been commercialised almost from the instagram -ness. Yeah, and what I'll do now, like if it's just about heat and my legs are sore, I'll just sit in the bath with my just my feet in the bath and I'll just have hot water and I'll just sit there for like 10 minutes and that promotes blood flow. And if I don't like that, I'll just have an extra long shower and just – have the shower dripping onto my hammies and then down my legs on my calves. So then that just promotes more blood flow. Well, how do you go with shin splints and knee problems, all that sort of stuff? I've been very lucky in that area. My main issues have been Achilles. Yeah, okay. Um, That's not a great issue to have though. <laughs> no, but I think with quality gym work and quality strength training, that can be fixed. And I fixed it in the past, but it's just come back recently with a change in load. How much time are you spending in the gym doing mobility and injury prevention work then? Um, well, I do, with my squad, we'll do about 40 minutes on Monday afternoon. So we'll do like stretches, mobility. Um, we'll do like foot exercises. Um, we'll do hurdle exercises for hip mobility. So we'll do a lot of that stuff all together as a group. And then Wednesday I'll hit the gym myself. Um, very lucky I have access just down the road at work to a spy gym. So that's pretty good. Um, I go there in my lunchtime at work um, and just do like 40 minutes of strength. Um, and then on the weekends, Saturday, I'll just do some like body weight stuff myself at home. And that's never kind of- Never biceps pumping. <laughs> never upper body. Never upper body. Uh, not really. So right now you're aiming for the next Olympic cycle. Oh, that's, yeah, I suppose that's a long-term goal. Very long-term. Yeah, you kind of, you always have that in the back of your head, but you don't think about it too much. And because, I mean, the only reason why you have it in the back of your head is like, well, why am I doing this sport? It's to one day just get to the highest level of running that you can. But you don't like go about every day thinking about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, like okay. you more think about the little goals and the little goals for me, like next year, World Unis, make an Australia team. Um, next year, do well at nationals, make a final, and then start thinking about the times I want to run. Um, and times, good times, maybe mean sponsorship can come along. So, yeah, you more think about the little goals. So, a running sponsorship, you did mention that to me before we recorded this. What, what would that entail? That actually spiked my interest quite a bit. Yeah. I'm pretty curious to know how that all works. So am I. I'm, I'm pretty curious too. The thing is you don't know much about it because it's a whole hidden world sponsorships. Um, it's all of the people that sign contracts are like sworn to like secrecy. So they don't really, no one talks about it. Um, oh, really? Yeah. You like, you, you try, you um, try search up on Google, like what do sponsored athletes get paid? You won't get anything. You'll get some threads on some like blog page. It's more about how do you get them? I you don't, yeah. That's, that's the other thing. It's all about connections. Oh, really? So it's, it's, it's very like networking. Yeah. It's not like you run that time, you're guaranteed a sponsorship. It's actually, yeah, it's who, you know, there's a lot of people in the U S right now who are making Olympic teams or almost making Olympic teams and are unsponsored because they potentially are less marketable. Maybe, maybe they might be a little bit older. Typically like sponsored brands will want younger people because there's more potential for growth. What would the dream sponsored brand be? Oh, Nike. Not Brooks or Reebok no, or Nike. Nike? Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> I, I wear Nike all the time just because I like I like the brand. I think it's it's a cool brand. Um, it is a cool brand. It is a cool brand, yeah. I don't really wear a lot of the casual stuff out because I don't really it's like It's more of an active wear, sports yeah. wear brand, I think. Yeah, so I will hopefully. But 
that's something that you can't really focus on too much because of those reasons. You just have to try and perform the best you can with your next season, et cetera. Yeah. You don't really think about like it's the same as that Olympic dream. It's like you don't really think about that. It's sort of just like if that happens, so awesome. But you just kind of keep chipping away. And you got to stay locked in. Yeah, you got to stay locked in. Well, we were talking about this on Run Club at Wednesday. Shout out Fletcher's Run Club again. And you were, we were talking about how you're running such an insane distance every single week to do a 1500 meter race. Yeah. And we we're talking about how maybe the in olden times people would train by just running 1500s and practicing those short distance and not doing a super high distance load per week. But now the training's changed and you're actually running so much more than your race is. And I was wondering if you could just explain kind of the reasons behind that. The recent change in training. Yeah. yeah. Why do you have to run so far just to do a 1500? Yeah, it's, it's, it is it's it's funny, but it's all about developing your aerobic engine because the 1500 is so um, – if you can like get your aerobic engine really good, you almost can just cruise through a 15 even if you weren't particularly fast. That probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but. No, no, it does for sure. Cause you were telling me as well, one of the, mar like for marathons, people are clocking a lot more distance than 40 Ks a week to go run a marathon. Yeah. Like the electric Chogi would be doing close to, I imagine 300 Ks a week. You'd think maybe at least 200. Yeah. That's um, just so insane to me. Yeah. Cause when I was prepping for the Rado swim, for example, I know swimming is quite different, but the Rado swim is 20 Ks and we were trying to clock 25 Ks a week. Yeah. But to hear like, this sort of ratio from where it's the opposite you're it's going, like i should be swimming 60 k's a week and it's like that's going to be impossible i think the thing as well um because in cycling as well it's a bit like that i think like they go and ride massive k's i, I wonder if it's it must be to do with how your body reacts to that training if i only went out and did let's say i'm doing a 1500 meter you were to go on the approach, like, let's just run all my runs the same time that I would run my 15, like three minutes, four minutes, whatever. You wouldn't really be getting a whole lot of benefit. Like your legs wouldn't have been hammered for hours and hours. Yeah. And you wouldn't be building up resilience in your legs. Because so I think that's that's the term that we use a lot, like putting Ks into your legs. Bit that's, of mileage in yeah. your legs. Yeah. Because I've been reading this book, 80-20 Triathlon, and it's talking about the intensities with what you should be exercising at and that 80% should be done at a low intensity, which is 60 to 78% of your max heart rate. And then the other 20% should be higher, which is above 78% of your max heart rate. And it's really fascinating the way they explain it. And they're describing kind of that you almost get more benefits from running slower at the lower heart rate. Yeah. And it almost doesn't make sense to common sense, but then they back it up with this science behind and explain really well why that is. Yeah. It's important to run slow. Definitely run slow, run fast is the slogan. A lot of run clubbers will use, which I agree with to an extent. I think where I was training in 2021 and 2022, there was an instruction from the coach to run only five minute, 15 Ks which relative to now, all my easy runs are at 4.30. So that was almost too slow. Yeah. And he did that to prevent injury. And that's really smart because when you've got young 18, 19 year olds. You just want to get the fitness space you want to, yeah, built you want up to without injury. Fitness. Exactly. You don't want big breaks in their training. So if you can tell people, we, we used to have like a, a red card, yellow card system that if you were to run quicker than 5.15 on your runs, he would check on Strava, you would get a yellow card. And if you do it twice, you get a red card and you can't come to training for a session. So it was pretty weird, but it was effective in stopping people from getting injured. And that's probably why you haven't had any big injuries. Well, yeah, back then I didn't really have any injuries. I haven't really had any injuries now. It's just been little tiny niggles. Um, but I think, yeah, since then reducing the pace or oh, sorry, well, it's increasing the pace. Reducing the time per yeah. kilometre. Yeah. Has been more effective in just building an aerobic base because if you go too slow, it doesn't really do anything. Yeah. 
Well, the book I was reading does say that if you go below a certain percentage of your max heart rate, then it is going to give you no benefit. Then it's more like active recovery. Yeah. So that's what we did. That's what we did today. So the long run is an active recovery jog with elevation. So we sit at like 445 pace. To be fair as well, you're probably a lot fitter now than you were in 2021. So So your heart rate's probably can sit lower while running faster than back then as well. Yeah. Another thing we're going to talk about is Olympics. The Olympics coming up now, you were saying that there's never been a time for a stronger field for the runners in this Olympics for Australia. Yeah, it's quite insane. Um, the, the women's in particular is actually probably even stronger than the men's um, because you've got, you've got an 18-year-old or 19-year-old girl who's gone to the Olympics who got selected back in April. Yeah, right. And like almost just come out of nowhere and it's – and that's just one of them. And there's like the Australia, I'm, I'm not sure when the selections are coming out. I think it might be in a few days, but in the 800, there's the Australian record holder and another girl who runs almost the same times who are both fighting for the third spot on the team. Cause the first two spots have already been chosen. So you've just got top quality athletes just fighting to get onto that team. Is it a pretty tough sort of scene to get a gig in? To make the track team for the Olympics? Yeah. Pretty cutthroat. Oh, just take take a look at the US track trials. Uh, they happened last week. There's a girl who won gold last year, or 2021 at the Olympics, and she fell over in the trials. And she's not going to the Olympics. Because she fell over. Because she didn't, yeah, she didn't come top three. So America's got a very cutthroat, Um, approach to their trials so they'll have a strict top three to cross the line are going to the olympics and that's good in some ways but like in that way but in that case if you've got someone who's literally ranked number one in the world and they can't even go to the olympics because because they had one bad race because they had one bad race and their country won't select them because that was the rule that was set out that it was only top three then that can become quite um, become quite controversial, and people might say she should be in because she's the best. Um, but then on the flip side, you've got countries maybe like Australia who don't have that rule, and it's fully discretionary on the Olympic selection panel for Athens Australia. It's um. That could almost be controversial in itself as well because they might make unjustified decisions. Exactly. So there's a lot of talk at the moment and you just flick through any like Facebook feed and you'll just see all of these comments about, you know, hating on Aths Australia. So, and and going both ways. So it, it becomes the risk of doing a very open, sorry, non-open and very um, subjective way of selecting people when it's only based on a committee's opinion then that opens up a lot of public debate. Wouldn't the best way just to do whoever runs the top three fastest times in official races in the year of the Olympics? Yeah, and that's sort of what Australia does. But then there was a whole drama that went on a few weeks ago with there was a girl who actually ran for the marathon the third fastest time, but she wasn't selected and the fourth fastest time girl was selected because they believed that she would actually be better. So it's like sometimes they'll go with it and then sometimes they won't, which is that subjective. And that's where the controversy That's where the controversy is, a lot, is arising. How and would you do it, Max? How would I do it? I reckon I've, I've had a lot of ideas about every four years for, for the Olympic cycle, you hold your trials and call them trials in, in June. So rather than having the nationals in April, you have it in June and then people have the opportunity to run to get selected for the team. And then it would be more like the swimming trials. So the Australian swimming trials just that, happened. that just happened, it was like however many nights of action and it was all streamed on Channel 9, like free to air, like everyone would be watching it. Um, that's the problem with Aths is it's streamed on 7 Plus. So you don't really get that kind of casual viewership. Um so, yeah, my dream would be it's streamed on a Channel free-to-wear, nine. yeah, something that everyone can see and it's held 
at a time where you can select the athletes. At the end of the meet, you go, these are all the athletes we're taking and that's it. And that would be cool. But then there's a risk that you have the US issue where if someone potentially fell over, then they wouldn't be able to get on the team. So maybe there does need to be an element of discretionary power of the selection committee. So I don't know how to do it, but that's potentially what you could do. It's a pretty unique perspective into how cutthroat it actually is because you wouldn't think that it'd be so cutthroat, but then you actually start to look into it and there's people that dedicate all of this time, so many hours of their lives, and like you're saying with this US chick, just to fall over to miss out. Yeah. all over, even though they've got the best time, the number one in the world, they got the gold medal. Well, I think she's actually, I saw a post the other day, she's trying to now, she's making her mission to get the world record in the 800. So there's still, even though the Olympics is on, there's still the professional circuit, the Diamond League, which is taking place, which takes place every year from like April through to the end of the season in September. And she's now made it her mission, which is pretty cool, to go run the world record. And, you know, it's like, all right, didn't make the Olympics, whatever. I was going to win it anyway. <laughs> Maybe that's what her mentality is. And she's like, I'm just going to go get the world record. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd probably prefer a gold medal at the Olympics, but if, if you can't make it, then go to something else. The other question I had with the Olympics is Australia versus other countries. Do you reckon we're genetically, like, advanced compared to other countries? Because you see, like, all these Kenyan runners and all these different – countries and they have just like different like biomechanical builds that just make them look so much faster yeah it it is definitely um you know you you hear people go to like a, a world championship distance running event and they'll be like oh, i was the first non-african to cross the line and that's an achievement yeah. um which is kind of yeah crazy to think that it's just such a whole that whole continent has seemingly just got such so an, dominant. an elite ability to run. Um, but I think now that because Australia is quite multicultural, you're actually seeing a lot of um, people from African countries. Get those hybrid genetics in. <laughs> and now uh, Australian residences and they're now competing for Australia. So you actually, maybe that's the benefit of being like a bit multicultural. We've got, <laughs> we've got, we got access to elite athletes. <laughs> <laughs> You poach them, you mean. Uh, but uh, I think in some events, like the 1500, the main battle in the world right now for gold is not between Africans or between a non-African versus an African. It's that Jacob. It's like Josh Kerr, um, who is up there for the 1500. Is he Australian? No, he's um, from Great Britain. So he actually fell over in the 800 meters the other day in their trials. But he's still going. He's he's going for the 1500. So he was never going to go for the eight. He was more using that as like a, a sh kind of a warm up shakeout for the 15 is what yeah. I believe happened. Um, so there's him and there's Jakob and there's this like kind of head to head battle that's brewing between these two. And they haven't faced off a lot but they did recently at a race in America and Josh Kerr beat Jakob. So really? yeah. And like Jakob's the reigning Olympic, but then um, in 2022 at the world champs, it was a guy, Jake Whiteman, another Brit who won. And then in 2023, it was Josh Kerr who won. So Jakob hasn't won since the Olympics, a significant major since the Olympics, but it's like, Jakob is unbeatable across a time trial event. So all the diamond leagues, he's like unstoppable because there's a pacer and he just follows the lights. They've all got lights around the track to be able to know how fast to run. So the, those races, he's like unbeatable. Um, but Do they have that in the Olympics? No. So the Olympics is all tactics and you could like, oh, there's a lot of debate about actually the athletes that, Athletics Australia has selected about like, oh, this person isn't fast enough. But the Olympics is all about tactics. And there's been people in the past, like there's a US guy, Matthew Senchwitz, who won the 2016 Rio 1500 in a time of like 340 something. It was, or it might've even been 350 he won. I'm not sure, but we'll be able So you would have won that race. 
Well, that's the thing. It was a sit and kick. So it was like, he just sat there and the race was so slow. Like we watch it later. Cause it's a seriously slow race for an Olympics. And then he was just able to blitz in the last lap and bring it home. So you don't necessarily have to be the fastest. Strategy. Yeah, it's not a time trial, the Olympics. So who do you predict to win this Olympics for 1500? I Kerr or Jakob? I reckon Jakob will win because I reckon he's been like flying a bit under the radar maybe in terms of he hasn't won two. He hasn't won in the past two years, so he needs to win one, he might feel. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. But, um, yeah, it'd be pretty cool if Jakob Ringerigsen won the 1500 and Carson Walholm won the 400 hurdles because they're both Norwegian Vikings and they're both pretty um, – yeah, Carson Walholm is a funny character, one of, um, one of the Australian, like, media dudes who goes off to all these races gave him a beer after the race and he's got spikes that have a beer opener on the end of it. And like, cause he did it for some commercial and this guy took him a beer and he thought, oh, this Carson's going to like say, you know, get out, never come back here. But he opened the beer and <laughs> had a sip. And no, he didn't. He was like, oh, I've been sober for like eight months. I'm not going to start now. Fair enough. But still pretty cool. So it'd be cool if those two would have been able to win because there's battle in the 400 hurdles as well. All right. And one last question. Prediction wise, do you think a world record will be broken this Olympics for the 1500? I think probably not because I think the – I feel like world records are really – they're obviously hard to come by. But they're one in the time trials, not the tactical Olympics. I feel like, yeah, world records are more likely to come out when it's a time trial type event and there's like a pacer involved. But then on the – like you look at 2012, um, the 800 Olympics and David Radisha – ran the world record then and he ran from the front and no one got in front of him the entire race. So he led from gun to tape. And so that's definitely like he was from Kenya and he just had an ability to run so quick. It's not even an endurance event. It's a sprint. Like he went through 49 through 400 and then probably ran, he ran a 140.8, I think. So ridiculously You've got these fast. Names and times unlock. Oh, when you yeah, I'm getting better because um, I'm surrounded by other athletes every day, pretty much. So you just yeah, the sum of your five people you surround yourself with. Yeah, exactly. So the more people that I surround myself with that are athletes, the more I just pick up. Um, my coach is a professional athlete, so I pick up a lot from that as well. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely keep a lookout for that 1500 battle for the Olympics. Yeah. And then hopefully I'll see you in the next Olympics. Well, hopefully, maybe. 2028, it's in Las Vegas. So it would be a great place to have that it. That would be pretty cool. And then it's Brisbane in 2032. You bring it home. Bring it on home. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Chev. Really appreciate it. Uh, cheers, mate. Thank you, Simon.